we we've taken a vacation before vacation because vacation on the farm on Pesach is not a vacation. It's the high seasons of um, the farm. And the whole world comes to the Arugot farm. That's what it feels like on Passover. And so Thiel and I just took the kids and right behind me, you can see the Sea of Galilee. We've come here for just two days um, to try to take away, to get away. And um, Ari and I, were just, I feel like we're in the middle of such a massive move now that I needed to get away from the farm in order to see the farm, see my life, see our mission, see everything that we're doing from the outside. And um, I literally just stepped out of the car after a three-hour drive, and um, here I am at the Sea of Galilee. And when I first got out of the car and I saw this spectacular view behind me, you know, we're celebrating the, the holiday of Passover, and 40 years they were in the desert. And imagine what they saw. They walked into the land of Israel, and then they saw this that's what they got a chance to see like the blessing beyond measure of having such a water source in the heart of their land and so there's something so holy about this area tiberius is one of the four holy cities of israel and just kind of connecting to such a um, a less green beautiful place where we're at the edge of the desert it's just something else but um i, I want to talk to you about what's on my heart and what I've been studying about Passover, and then I guess hopefully bring it all together. But um, Pesach, the word itself, is usually translated as Passover. But in fact, it's, it, it could be read as two separate words, at least phonetically. Pe, sach. Pe means mouth. Pe, sach means to speak. And then you have the Haggadah. Haggadah is the little liturgy that we read throughout the Passover Seder. And that's also about speaking. Lehagid means to tell, to speak. And the entire mitzvah of the day, and the reason why we have the celebration of Passover, is to tell over the story, to give it over to the next generation, to, to tell over the story of our people, and to make sure that we realize, feel, and know that we are the next chapter in that beautiful story that happened so many centuries ago and that we're continuing to tell the story that you know my father told me and that his father told him and that his father told him and that his mother told her daughter and all the way back there's just no other tradition like it it's not so much about faith as much as it is about continuing on um, the god-given mission that our family was given our family was given a mission the children of israel and that mission ultimately was to spread to the world. But Pesach to speak, Pesach, mouth to speak. And the Haggadah, well, I was learning this beautiful Torah, and it said that the idea of Passover is to redeem our speech. That's one of the spiritual workings that we have to do. It's not just about the Geulah, the full redemption, but specifically the way to full redemption is through redeeming our speech. And I was trying to figure out, like, where did that come from, that idea? And Tehillah said, you know, she thinks it comes from when Pharaoh was telling Moses, you know, God, just go out. Go out and, and, and worship your God, but just you know, leave the women and the children here, and I want you to do that. He didn't really want us to do that. And even when Moses said, no, we're going to go out and just for a few days, and uh, he didn't really mean that either. And a lot of times in life, we say one thing, but we really don't mean what we say. It's like sometimes I'm maybe frustrated at a worker, frustrated at my wife, frustrated at my kids. And I'm saying one thing that I'm upset about, but really there's something underlying that I'm not really speaking of. And to redeem our speech is to actually go to the heart of it all. What do you really want to say? What's really on our hearts? That needs to come out what's really on our hearts that needs to come out to hashem what's on our heart that needs to come out to our loved ones and you know today ari and i um we're going to launch this campaign to build the aru goat farm and i've been working and thinking what is it that i want to say because this isn't just an opportunity for us to rally 
our people together and bring people together to build. But this is really a time to redeem our speech. We finally have a platform and we're going to be spreading these ideas. What do we want to say? What's on my heart? And this is what I've come to. Yes, the Arugod farm is the most strategic farm in Gush Etzion. It's the flagship farm. It's the one that's settling the land of Israel. And it's, it's sent out branches that are really a, a support to new farms that are being established. We're more than just um, an idea. We're a movement that's making an impact in the land that will change things for future generations. Really what happens in Judea and Samaria in our generation will affect Israel for who knows how many generations to come. Our generation's work is so important within the unfolding story. We are the generation whose mission is to settle the land. But the truth is that's, that's only one layer. There is something a little bit deeper, but I'm almost scared to say it, of what the Aru Goat Farm is. But I feel like if there's ever been a time, it's now. And Moses, you know, we talk about redeeming his speech. He was the one that had a stutter. And maybe he had a stutter because it wasn't easy for him to deal with the lies and trickeries of Pharaoh. And ultimately, he gave the greatest speech in human history. The book of Deuteronomy is Moses' speech that you read for months at a time. He became the greatest orator. <laughs> he became the greatest speaker. And so if there is a time to sort of draw on Moses' leadership, the one who represents Netzach, which menatzach means not only victory, but it also means to conduct, to sort of lead the orchestra and bring the harmonies into place. All of us play a certain role, play a certain note within the symphony of our movement. And so how can I redeem my speech? What do I really believe? What would I really want to share if I had the courage to say it? And so this is what I believe. I believe that Hashem sent Ari and I to the Aru Goat Farm in order to create a window into the Messianic era. That's what it is. It's an opportunity in our generation to fully bring down the vision of the prophets into the material world. What would it look like if the Jewish people returned to the land of Israel, returned to the mountains of Judea, establish a headquarters in the mountains of King David? How would we live? How would we raise our family? What would it look like to have a place that was open to the righteous among the nations that want to come to the land and learn Torah, to receive the Torah from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem, to watch the desert blossom like a rose, to watch the barren mountains flourish again, to create the vision the prophets had, just a window, just one mountain, just one farm, could we make a window into what it would look like if Mashiach was already here right now? Now, we may not completely redeem the entire world, but what if that one window was enough inspiration, just one candle that could light up a whole room? What if just one vision of what it would look like when believers come together to do the impossible, that stand up against nation states that have tried to destroy us, that have stand up against sometimes Israel's own secular government that have tried to destroy our vision. And with just absolute faith and dedication, we rally believers together and say, this is a mission that we can accomplish together, that we could actually create a window, a mirror, an insight, a peek into the messianic era in our lifetime. That's what I want to dedicate my life to. That's what I want to bring people to taste. That's what happens already at the Arugot farm. People don't even know what they're experiencing, but tears start to come out of their eyes because they've touched something that's ineffable. You can't really speak it yet. But as we continue to build it, it continues to be revealed. But what are we revealing? We're revealing the vision of the prophets. We're revisioning prophecy that's actually manifesting. When we talk about the Bible coming to life, it's saying that it's not just the Bible coming to life. It's God's presence actually animating our lives, animating the ground, bringing the souls that need to come and be touched to King David's mountain, 
King David, he is the father of the messianic line. It's not a coincidence that Ark Farm is stationed in his headquarters, in his mountains, where he taught the entire world how to pray. Because the temple, it's not a house of Torah for all nations. It's a house of prayer for all nations. And the king that taught us all how to pray. It's in those mountains that those prayers came into the world. And so for us to actually build a window into the messianic era and allow anyone that wants to participate, no matter what their background, no matter what their beliefs, no matter where they're from, whatever their religion is, whatever their ethnicity is, it is to rebuild the fallen sukkah of David. It is exactly what it is. And we build it together. And then who knows where that might take us, where we're trying to just fix the world on one mountain to really fix it right. But perhaps if we start with one mountain at the edge of the desert, maybe that will actually change the entire world. Maybe that is the root. As everyone's striking at the branches of all the problems of the world, what if we actually bring the light that the prophets promised us? And we say, we don't want to wait for the light to come, but we're going to try to draw the light down into the world and build it, manifest it, believe it in action to take our emuna, to take our belief and bring it into emun, to bring it in to action. And that faith and action would manifest a vision that was given to us that's directing the entire world, whether they know it or not. But somehow the Jewish people have returned to the land of Israel. The Hebrew language has been revived and the mountains of Judea are flourishing. And so could we possibly build it? And I think that that's the offer that's now on the table for anyone that wants to be a part of it with us. And you know, I'm looking at myself here on Zoom and I'm wearing a, a baseball hat. And the A here is for Aru Goat. It's not for Atlanta. <laughs> and so Ari and I, we're, we're not mystics and sages and important politicians and leaders. We just try to do good, try to align ourselves with the will of God. We're just Jews living in Judea. But maybe just from that simple place of just Jews wanting to live in Judea and manifest our mandate to be a light unto the nations. Could we actually do the impossible? Could we manifest a miracle? Could we bring a window into the messianic era that may just pave the way for the messianic era itself? It just takes enough courage to dream it, but then to, to work towards it to believe that that's a dream that we could accomplish in our lifetime. What would we rather do in our life than go for the absolute gold, to go for the ultimate? And so that's what's on my heart. It's not so much about Israel's strategic needs and it's not so much about you know developing a new place. It's really about fulfilling the dream of 4,000 years where God told Abraham, you got to get to this land. And then from there, you'll be a blessing to all families of the earth. You're going to need to build a kingdom. And so in the headquarters of the king, that's where it started. Let's start building it. That's the dream. And so that's what's on my heart. And hopefully I've redeemed my speech because there's so many reasons to support the Arugot farm and to support the movement to settle the land of Israel. But when I really think about what I really want to say it's so much more than just settling the land. It really is in our own small way by fixing this mountain, by bringing that light, it's really trying to redeem the world. And so may we be blessed in the ho holiday of redemption, Chagakiwula, that we should bring it, that we should work towards it, that we should have enough courage to jump into the seas. And so this is... um. An amazing video that was prepared almost for this time for us by the Christian Broadcasting Network. And I don't think that Ari and I could have done a better job ourselves, but they came out and they wanted to see what we were doing. And we said, well, we're, we're really trying to bring the Bible to life. And so if this is an opportunity to share what the purpose and the mission and the light of the Arugot farm is, then I would encourage everyone 
to share this short video with all of their friends and family, if not to support the Aru Goat Farm, wake them up to the prophecy that is unfolding in the land of Israel in biblical destiny that's quite literally manifesting before our eyes. So here's the video Ari and I made, and I'm sure you're going to love it. On these hills, not far from Jerusalem, lies the Aru Goat Farm. For six years, its founders have built a complex on land where previously there was nothing but barren hills. Located in Judea, its founders see the place as the Bible coming to life. CBN News met with two of its founders, Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimple. Well, tell us where we are. We're in the heart of the land of Judea. Um, Bethlehem is about 15 minutes that way. Right over there, as those buildings kiss the sky, that's Jerusalem. 45 minutes directly this way is Hebron. And if you triangulate that, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and Hebron, and you bring it right here, we are in the heart of the land of Judea. Gimpel talks about the connection to King David. And as a young boy, David would take his sheep out and pasture his sheep in these lands. And according to the Jewish tradition, most of the book of Psalms was written here in these mountains before David became king. So in his time of trouble, where did he run to? To the place that he knew best. He knew where the caves were. He knew where the water holes were. He knew how to live here. He knew how to survive here. These are historic holy mountains. Mm -hmm. The UN and many countries consider the mountains where David wrote the Psalms occupied territory and see the Jews who live there in a place they call the West Bank as an obstacle to peace. And why do they call it the West Bank? Because it's much easier to say, Let's get the settlers out of the West Bank. Then let's remove the Jews from Judea, right? The reason Jews are called Jews is because we're from Judea. This is our indigenous land. The first Jew that was called a Jew was Mordechai, the Jew, but he was from the tribe of Benjamin. So why was he called a Jew? Because he was exiled from Judea. So this is the most natural, holistic place for a Jew to actually grow and thrive right here in Judea. Local leaders asked these farmers to settle the land to create a tourist attraction and a strategic buffer. It's become much more. When I came out here, after just a few weeks, all of the strategy and the military, none of that mattered at all. So for me, I think for Jeremy too, when we came out here, it's like, this is what it is to be a Jew. Maybe not for every Jew, but for us out here, this is just the place where it's like, oh, this is just the most natural thing that could ever possibly happen. Both Ari and I felt called to come here and then pave this road and open the place up where the Psalms were written. I mean, imagine that. King David taught every Catholic in the world, every Christian in the world, every Jew in the world. When someone is sick, they open up the book of Psalms and he taught us all how to pray to God. And those prayers entered the world here. So this place is meant to be a center for prayer and worship and song and music and art and Torah that's open to everyone from every background. One common perception about this land is that Jews and Arabs can't coexist. That's not the case here. And now if you go to our Bedouin village near us, an Arab village over there, and you say to them, what do you think of these Jews here? They will say they are beloved friends of ours. They are a blessing to us and they're a blessing. I know that they would say that because they've come here and they said that they would stand with us. Okay, Jeremy, Ari, where are we now? So this is the top of the mountain. Uh -huh. And according to Jewish law, on the top of a mountain, you need to build a structure that's dedicated to the God Most High. Mm -hmm. And so this is our house of prayer, and it's taken us seven years to build. I consider this place the diamond in the crown of everything we've done, possibly the diamond in the crown of, of Judea, right? This is the, the soul of our place, is really right here. What's so beautiful is that, you know, we are surrounded by many different types of people, but the mattresses that you see here and the pillows in our house of prayer was donated to us by the Muslim Arab village right down here. They so much appreciated us coming here because when we came here, we repaved the roads that lead to their village as well. Police officers are now patrolling down the roads, making sure people are driving safer. We've been a blessing of this place. One of the most important elements of this place is, as we were talking about before, the words of the prophets, that when we return to the land, God will remove from us a heart of stone and put within us a heart of flesh and circumcise our hearts. In addition to the house of prayer, the farm includes several homes, a retreat center in the making, hundreds of trees, and a vineyard. They also host an online Bible study called the Land of Israel Fellowship. Throughout the building, the Book of Amos serves as their blueprint. Jeremy, Ari, we're here on a, a, a hillside, but you see this as prophecy coming to life, is that right? Yeah, I mean, this is 
this is prophecy coming to life. There's a, a village over there called Ma'ale Amos. This is undoubtedly, irrefutably, the very land in which the prophet Amos had his prophecy. Right, he was actually a cowboy, right? And so his prophecy was in these mountains. And the last three verses of his prophecy, he says, I'll return the exiles of my people, and they will uh, rebuild desolate cities, and they will plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they will plant gardens and eat their fruit, and I will plant them upon their land, and they'll never be uprooted again. And so here we have vineyards right in the very land in which he prophesies. Amos was in these mountains here, and he had this vision that there would be rebuilt cities and vineyards and fruit trees. And then I wonder, I mean, this building that's being built here and this vineyard that's planted here, was this exactly what he saw? But we built it with the inspired words. He guided us to plant that. Chapter eight of the book of Amos, I think summarizes our whole mission here. If you wanna know what is our business plan, the book of Amos, there will be a hunger in the land. And the hunger will not be for bread, and the thirst will not be for water, but to hear the words of Hashem. The retreat center and the house of prayer, everything we're doing is to satisfy this hunger that isn't for bread, and the thirst is not for water, but to hear the words of God. And the words of God are echoing from the mountains of Judea to the entire world. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Aragot Farm, Judea. Hi, my name is Jeremy Gimpel. A lot of people want to know exactly what the Land of Israel Fellowship is and what members receive when they join. So let me explain. The Land of Israel Fellowship is a global online community with hundreds of members from over 40 countries around the world. There are live sessions and gatherings that create a direct personal connection to the land of Israel and to lovers of Israel from around the world. There's no online gathering that I'm familiar with that is connected to the land of Israel that unites and brings together such a diverse group of people, backgrounds and nationalities. It feels like prophecy. It feels like something we need in these times, like a window in to a better future on the horizon. There's a divine unity we experience every week in our fellowship broadcast. We heard these amazing teachings from an authentic Hebrew and Israel perspective and our jaws drop. Not only because they ring so true and are such a blessing, because they are so consistent with what we believe. These Sunday morning gatherings are nothing less than a house of prayer for all nations. Cindy Lowe, the United States of America. The Land of Israel Fellowship is an amazing resource for learning Torah, the Bible, and the prophets, unfiltered and uncensored directly from the Land of Israel. We've been studying Torah for almost 20 years, but we feel we are stepping into it more than ever and seeing new depth and dimensions to scripture. We're encouraged more and more every week. Callan Ardell, USA. Members receive access to all the archives in the library of teachings on every portion of the Torah, the biblical feasts, Hebrew prayer, prophecy, sessions on the ancient wisdom of the prophets of Israel to help us navigate through these turbulent times. These sessions are so rich. I re-listen to each and truly each session is the best one yet. Tehillah is a tremendous asset and the teachings Ari shares are so rich. I've read the Bible so many times and I've known the things you are teaching. The Hebrew understanding is what Christians have missed for century. Sister Georgian from Germany. The Land of Israel Fellowship is truly unique because it's built upon personal relationships with the teachers of the fellowship. Myself, Rabbi Ari Abramowitz in Tehillah Gimpel. Every member has direct access to the staff 24 six via email or direct WhatsApp to ask questions, to comment, to connect directly to all the teachers. And over the last years, we've connected to some of the most beautiful people on the planet. So if you wanna find out more and join the Land of Israel Fellowship, you can click on the link below. And if you wanna try it out for just a month, you can email fellowship at thelandofisrael.com and we'll hook you up. I hope to see you. Shalom from the mountains of Judea.